says in a manner uh, which is more contextually relevant. He is always our inspiration. It's definitely an honor for us. मुझे इतने बहुत खुश हो रही है वो आ रहे हैं हमारे कॉलेज में not in talking terms with me, I haven't said a word yet. <laughs> well, uh, why this uh, youth and truth, how this came about is, in the last thirty-seven years that I've been active with people, one constant refrain has been that people, thousands of people asking the same question, Sadhguru, when I was twenty, where were you? You came when I'm sixty, if you had come when I was twenty, I would have done so many things, things like this. So we thought we will step out and meet all those people who are below twenty-five years of age, because uh, what we call as life is essentially a combination of a certain amount of time and a certain amount of energy. Time is rolling away for all of us at the same pace. You sit, you stand, you work, you sleep, do whatever you want. Time is rolling away at the same pace for all of us. Time rolling away essentially means our life is rolling away. We can't help that, we can't stop it. You can't say, yesterday I did not do anything worthwhile, so I'm going to roll it back. There's no such thing. But we can manage the energy. So when we say youth, youth is that part of life where your energies are at their peak, most exuberant. Most youth do not understand this. They think this is going to be like that always. It's not going to be like that always. It's just this segment of life where your energies are at their best. When energies are at their best, people are confused to the core. <laughs> Generally, I'm saying, not you. <laughs> if only a little more clarity and balance can be brought to this exuberant sense of life energy which youth carry. I thought many things could happen. One of the most important things is, say every human being has a certain genius, not just in an art school, everywhere. But in my opinion, tell me if you am wrong, maybe in art school the percentages may be different. I am talking about the whole population if you take, not even one percent of the human beings find an inner situation and an external ambience where their genius will blossom. Not even one percent. That's a poor humanity. If we could only in this generation raise it to ten percent, let's say, we would have a phenomenal world. Because societies and nations, have happened either as a phenomenal happening or a mediocre happening, depending upon how many people unfolded their genius at a certain time in that particular society. Without human intelligence finding a certain expression, whether it's business or politics or art or music, spirituality, none of them, will really rise and flourish. So the most important thing about this is, 
when energies are at their peak, how much balance do we find within ourselves? How… how much clarity do we have? Clarity essentially means or lack of clarity essentially means that our own thoughts and emotions have become an impediment in our lives. For most human beings, this is the reality. At the age of fifty, sixty, they've still not figured out how to handle their thought. When are they going to figure it, I don't know. Suppose you bought a phone, after three years you still don't know how to use it. Are you a nutcase or no, I'm asking? Hello? You don't want to use it, that's a different thing. You want to use it, but you do not know which is front side, which is back side of the phone, yet tragedy or no? This is the case with most human beings because of all the technology that you find, I see some third eyes rising. I know they are either these days Chinese eyes or Samsung eyes or some of them are Americans. <laughs> I mean, the phones are rising. <clears throat> Among all the pieces of technology that we have produced in this world, among all the gadgets that we have made, phones, computers, supercomputers, don't you find, do you agree with me that this is the most sophisticated machine on the planet? Hello? Yes. Have you read the user's manual? <laughs> so somehow, by accident, handling it, if you handle by accident, anxiety is natural, isn't it? Hmm? If you are doing something accidentally, let's say you are driving accidentally, isn't anxiety natural? And when you are driving accidentally, suppose the car starts going very fast, isn't fear natural? It started going very fast, isn't terror natural? The problem is not the car, the problem is not the speed, the problem is you're driving it accidentally. If you knew how to drive it, faster it goes, the better it is. Why is that not true with this one? If you know how to handle this, more things happen out of this, more exciting it should be, isn't it? If two things happen in people's mind, they go crazy. <laughs> the world is being taught today, all over, United States is popular for this right now. I think it's also reached Mumbai, after all you're on the west coast <laughs> I'm sure it's reached here also, everybody's going about telling you, be in the moment. Huh? They're telling you? You're trying <laughs> So, what does be in the moment mean? Well, please be somewhere else and show me. <laughs> Can you? Can you be somewhere else right now? No. So what is the teaching about be in the moment? What they're telling you is, do not think about yesterday, do not think about tomorrow. It took millions of years of tremendous amount of evolutionary work to get your brains to this level of capability, yes? And now somebody is telling you, don't use it. The beauty of this mind, the beauty of your intelligence is, you can remember every experience of life vividly. <laughs> Otherwise, if you artists have amnesia, they don't remember a thing, they can't produce a thing, isn't it? Hello? The visual memory, isn't it vital? We can remember things vividly, every experience, every sight, every sound, everything that came to us through the five senses. And we have a fantastic sense of imagination. This… these are the two most fantastic faculties of being human, isn't it? Now they're telling you, do not think about the past, do not think about the future, be in the moment. Anyway you're in the moment, you cannot go anywhere, can you? Try please. Can you go somewhere else? 
No. So they're telling you, your memory and imagination, you must freeze it. The entire human experience is between these three dimensions. We have a vivid sense of memory. Memory not just what you remember, what you call as my body is just a repository of memory. There's evolutionary memory, there's genetic memory, there is karmic memory, articulate and inart inarticulate forms of memory. Entire human experience and human form is because of memory, isn't it so? If you eat dog food, do you think you will take the shape of a dog in ten days? Hello? Because this one remembers, there's evolutionary memory in this, you do what you want. This remembers, this has to take only this form, isn't it? And this remembers million years ago how your forefathers were, has it forgotten? No. So this is memory, they're telling you, do not be conscious about that. And they're telling you, do not imagine a tomorrow. Why they're telling you this is, a whole lot of people do not know how to handle their memory and imagination, that's what they suffer most. What happened ten years ago, they still suffer. What may happen day after tomorrow, they already suffer. They're not suffering life, they're essentially suffering their memory and their imagination. What they should be enjoying most, they're suffering. So somebody is saying, saying, just be in the moment, do not remember, do not imagine. For this there is a simpler solution, if we remove half your brain, you will be just in the moment. <laughs> yes, you will be really being in the moment. The nature of human mind is, you can be here absolutely involved, and still think of two dozen things, yes or no? Possible or no? Because they have not read the user's manual, they are trying to operate the phone from the back cover. They think there is something wrong with this one. No, on this planet, this is a peak of evolution, isn't it? Hello? Some of you don't seem to agree. No, I'm not referring to you individually, I'm asking generally. <laughs> Human beings are supposed to be the peak of evolution on this planet, isn't it so? So we have the greatest neurological system, we have a brain which is flowered into cerebral possibilities, but now we are suffering that one thing so much. Recently, about four or five months ago, you might have heard about this, it was all on the news. A television anchor from Hyderabad, anybody? Telugu people? Okay. A television anchor from Hyderabad, thirty-four-year-old woman, a young woman jumped off the fifth floor and killed herself. And she left a note saying, nobody is responsible for my death, my brain is my enemy. The only reason we are a dominant life on this planet is simply because you got some brains, isn't it? Otherwise, you are not comparable to any other, other animal in their capabilities. You are not as strong as an elephant, not as fierce as a tiger, as capable as a buffalo either. Yes, they're all eco-friendly on top of it. The only reason why you are valuable is because of your intelligence, isn't it? But that is the biggest problem. The only thing human beings are suffering is their own intelligence. Yes or no? If you are alone and you suffer, obviously you are in bad company. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes or no? I am with you and I suffer. I can say it's because of her I am suffering. But I am alone and I am suffering, bad company or no? So, we thought as a part of this Youth and Truth, we will reach out to the youth and bring as much clarity as possible. For this you have to shoot your questions. Please. Uh, hello, sir. My question I to you I have not is... gotten any night 
knighthood or anything yet uh, i believe that art is anything that expresses who we are as individuals what are your views on that and how can one make the most of one's talent say uh, this <clears throat> i am not an artist and uh, if i say something abrasive please pardon me okay there are two ways to do any art music art whatever expressions we make even spiritual process or business or politics or anything that we do in the world there are two ways to do it one is it is a stamp that we leave on the world it's a footprint that we leave on the world this i was here another is find expression not to myself but to a larger life that's happening here which is bigger than me much bigger than me or you give an expression to that those who are intent on leaving a footprint they shall never fly so it's your choice whether you want to leave a footprint or you want to fly that which flies leaves no trace of anything but it flies it's very different so if it's an expression of your individuality you will leave a footprint but if you become a conduit for something bigger a phenomena that's happening here then you leave no footprint but you don't have to leave a footprint because you fly and it'll always be celebrated at uh, this rate you're going to crush everybody it's better to pass it <laughs> namaskaram satguru my question is as you have said for many times shiva has explored Let all the dimensions shiva has explored all the dimensions of life everything he has explored in this age when the energy is at its peak how can we explore every aspect of the life without being untouched and getting attached to all the compulsive activities we say i don't want to drink but somewhere we are afraid that we will be addicted to it my question is how can we explore every aspect of life without being untouched see uh, nobody says i want to drink some people drink some people don't some people who drink may drink for the pleasure of it some people who drink may drink because they want to drown something within themselves some people drink because everybody is drinking it's an evolutionary <laughs> it's an evolutionary issue you know when we were monkeys if one did this everybody did this and some people don't drink because they think it's morally wrong some people don't drink because they're afraid their parents and society what they will say some people don't drink because they found something better within themselves they found something far better with than a drink so it never arose in their mind that they have to drink because they're doing wonderfully by themselves they don't need any chemical help from outside so these are different ways if you want to explore life because you can only explore life you cannot explore art you cannot explore spirituality you cannot explore something you can only explore life yes well you may look at it from a certain perspective somebody may look at it in an artistic way in an aesthetic way in a musical way in a spiritual way but essentially we are exploring life even if you are uh, looking at inanimate things you are only exploring life because nothing happens outside of you everything that happens happens only within you isn't it do you see me right now even if you're not hearing 
Even if you're not listening, are you able to see me? Can you use your one hand and point out where I am? Tch, you got it wrong. This light is falling upon me, reflecting, going through your lenses, inverted image in the retina, you know the whole thing? You know the whole story, right? Where do you see me now? Within yourself. Where do you hear me right now? Within yourself. Where have you seen the whole world? Within yourself. Anything that ever happened to you, joy or misery, light or darkness, pain or pleasure, happened only within you, isn't it so? Did you ever experience anything outside of you? Did you? So the only thing that you are experiencing is life. You may think this is color, you may think this is sound, you may think this is something else, no. In your experience, you are only experiencing the way different things imprint upon your life. That's the only way you can experience it, there is no other means of experience for you. So essentially you are only exploring life because nothing else you have access to, yes? Right now I may think I am looking at this person, but no, I am only looking at the image that happens in my mind, isn't it so? Right now if you touch somebody next to you, think you are experiencing that person's hand, no. You only experience the sensations in your hand, isn't it so? So your entire experience of life is absolutely within you. That means you are capable of experiencing only this one life. So is it a trap that you can only experience this? No. If you experience this, then everything becomes a possibility because... See, when it comes to body, we clearly know this is my body, that's your body, hundred percent. This is my mind, that's your mind, one hundred percent, isn't it? But when it comes to life, there is no such thing as your life and my life. This is a living cosmos, you just captured a little bit of it. How much you captured, how much life have you gathered within you will determine what is the scope and scale of your life? So whether you call it art, whether you call it music, whether you call it spiritual process or whatever the nature of activity, activity is a means to open up your borders of individuality. Well, that first question, is it a way of stamping my individuality? No, it is a way of erasing the boundaries of your individuality so that something larger than yourself happens to you. Something larger than what you think as myself happens to you in your life. This is the purpose of love, this is the purpose of art, this is the purpose of sexuality, this is the purpose of spiritual process. Essentially, that something larger than myself must happen to me. Because only if this happens, I feel trapped inside this. Yes or no? You interpret this in many different ways, but essentially what you're looking for is, you want to somehow go beyond the limitations of your own boundaries. The word yoga, you've heard of the word yoga? Tch. Hello? The word yoga means people think, <laughs> twisting and turning is not yoga. The word yoga means union. Union means if you sit here, there is you and the universe. If you sit here tightly fixed with your boundaries, it is you versus the universe. You versus universe is a stupid competition. Hello? Those of you are like this all the time, it's an absolutely idiotic competition between you and the universe. If you have any sense, you don't compete with the universe because you're a small speck in this universe. How do you compete? This is what individuality means. Individuality means you are head-on with the universe. Yoga means you obliterated the boundaries of your individuality. The distinction between what is you and what is the universe has gone down considerably. If you sit here, 
what is you and what is ev everything else is about the same in your experience. If this happens to you, then you will see there is no such thing as my life and your life, there is just one big life happening. This experience is needed, a tremendous experience is needed within you if you want to create something fantastic. If you want to create something brilliant, something unique, something truly of some significance, you need an experience. But this is not <laughs> I'm if you find me too prejudiced, please tell me. I will tell you why I am prejudiced. The influence of European art on the rest of the world is uh, disproportionately large. There is no joy in the art. The more miserable it is, the more profound it is supposed to be. It should look grotesque and because this became a European trait that in their own thought, they… they thought their thought is so supreme, they went to the point of saying, I think so, I exist. I want to ask you a simple question. Is it because you think you exist or because you exist you may think? Which way is it, please? Because you exist, you may think, because most people are in such a state of mental diarrhea, <laughs> they think thought is a continuous process. No, life is an ongoing process. Thought should happen consciously, isn't it? Now I'm here, I exist. Now my hand moves when I want. Suppose this hand all the time it's jumping around like this, you will think I have an ailment. And definitely you can't be an artist <laughs> with a jumping hand. <laughs> right now, this is the state of most minds. They're always jumping all over the place. And they think it's normal. It's not normal. But Sadhguru, everybody is like this only. Well, that's how it is in asylum. <laughs> everybody will be like that only. Only the doctor will be crazy. Rest will be like that only, isn't it? <laughs> so, it's important that there is an experience of exuberance, joy, profoundness. But right now in the world, a whole lot of people think only in misery you can be profound. Because it is true that for most people, their pain is the most profound experience of their life. To know, profoundness of joy, to know profoundness of love, to know profoundness of exuberance and intensity of life, it takes something more. But if we just stick a pin into you, just a pin, not a sword, just a pin, the pain goes to the core, isn't it? Hello? Just a little pin, one inch pin, if I stick it, <laughs> so deep. So pain goes… becomes profound much more easily. So a lot of people think pain is the source of profoundness. This has to change. Indian art and the rest of the world must get liberated from the European art forms because it comes from deep states of misery, very deep states of misery. Suffering has been celebrated. There is nothing celebratory about suffering. Maybe you can celebrate somebody else's suffering. There is nothing celebratory about your own suffering, isn't it? <laughs> Please. So how Shiva… Uh, uh, <laughs> you still with him only? <laughs> how Shiva explored his life, the different dimensions, I wanted to ask that also. Uh, that's what I said just now without mentioning his name, but <laughs> what you're referring to as Shiva means, Shiva means that which is not. That means he is not. He is not means what? He is in a state of abandon. An artist should know a state of abandon as nothing phenomenal will ever come out of you. 
if you are doing it self-consciously, if I paint this, how much money will I get? Then you must be a street-side caricature artist. If you want to produce something fantastic, what you consider as myself should go, at least for moments. If not continuously, at least for moments it must go. Shiva means that's what it means. He's not. He's simply not. He's in a state of exuberance. When he's still, he's not. Otherwise, when he gets into movement, he gets into the most intense dance form. So then also he is not. He doesn't know the in-between. He is on this peak or on this peak. He doesn't rest in between. So that's why exuberance and abandon is more important than control. Karam Sadhguru, uh, my question is, what are we supposed to do when we are angry and uh, how to deal with deep-rooted anger? It depends who is the victim <laughs> You <laughs> Suppose you are angry with your mother, you behave one way, you are angry with your friend another way, you are angry with your professor <laughs> completely different way, yes or no? So who is your victim right now? <laughs> Accordingly, you should do. But now, you are asking this question as if anger is a natural part of you. Are you angry right now? What's your name? Rohini. Rohini. Are you angry right now? No. Then why are you bothered about anger? Once in a way, you get angry. Tch, yes? You get angry. Anger doesn't happen to you. You get angry. You like it? You don't like it. Then why do you do it? <laughs> See, around us so many people will do so many things that we don't like. Yes or no? So many things in Mumbai happening, things that we don't like are every day happening. But at least within you, only what you want should happen within this, isn't it? Huh? Within this person, only what I want must happen here. I cannot decide that only what I want should happen with you, but I can definitely decide only what I want must happen within me, isn't it? If you could decide only what you want should happen within you, would you choose anger or joy? What's your choice? Please choose, I'm going to bless you. <laughs> See, you want the highest level of pleasantness for yourself, isn't it? then why is such a thing not happening? As I said earlier, you never read the user's manual. How this functions has not been looked at. Do not go by the example of people who came here a few, few years earlier than you, that, no, no, my mother also was like that, my grandmother also was getting angry, so I am also getting angry. They should not be the leading lights of your life. I want you to look at it. Your thought, your emotion, your body must happen the way you want, isn't it? Huh? If somebody else can decide what should happen within you, this is ultimate slavery, isn't it so? Huh? This is the worst form of slavery, I can decide what happens within you. This is not right. What happens around you, maybe we can decide, but nobody should decide except yourself what happens within you. If you decide, you would keep this in the highest state of pleasantness for sure. You wouldn't be battling with anger. It's not just about anger, fear, stress, tension, don't address them separately. Essentially, your mind is not taking instructions from you. Why? Because you don't know where the damn keyboard is. Yet, we gave you a supercomputer, you do not know where, where the keyboard is. So one day you did this, something worked, another day you did this, something worked. You know, have you seen people, the radio doesn't work, boom! <laughs> and it works sometimes. <laughs> that's not a technology, that's chance <laughs> Have you seen this? If something doesn't work, people think, tap, tap, tap. 
it'll work. And lot of people are using this for human beings also. <laughs> Something doesn't work, tap tap and it'll work. In Tamil Nadu there is a saying, naala kurta yalla sariyaidu. That means, if you slap them four times, everything will get fixed. <laughs> Doesn't get fixed like that. <laughs> Namaskaram Sadhguru. Um, where are you, where are you, where are you? Yeah. Oh. So my name is Ujaswika Sahu. I would first like to really give a warm welcome to you from the JJ campus on behalf of the students. Uh, so I... So we are very, we architecture sports students especially, we're really aroused and excited uh, about this event, mainly because we are very well aware of your contributions to your Kayambatur uh, ashram. So, uh, my question is a bit along the academic lines. Uh, so, I, as a, we as architecture students have always been taught to build in the context, to look at the culture the, wherein the, your site is or wherever your project is going to be built. Uh, but now, when I see today the world, uh, in India especially, uh, urbanization is basically blind westernization, where we simply build glass boxes, which we know and understand that does not suit to the climate or the context of India. So, my question is that we as Indians have not yet figured out what India's modern architecture is about, while we simply copy the Westerners. <laughs> so, I, what do you think should be India's modern, uh, modern architecture? <coughs> Why we copy the West, not just in architecture, in just everything. I see a whole lot of women in Mumbai have turned blonde. <laughs> I have no problem if your hair turns blue or green or purple or red, but blonde. <laughs> I have no problem with that color either, it's just that they left us seventy years ago, but they're still living in our minds, at least as a generation. We must stay away from that. When you're completely away, then you can make your hair color whatever the hell you want. But not in imitation of somebody, isn't it? You can make it whatever color you want. You want paint seven colors in your hair, please do it. I have no issue about that. But you shouldn't be doing it because some color is superior to your color. That's apartheid, isn't it? Unfortunately, when I see even in United States, a whole lot of African-American people have blonde hair these days. All this fight about civil liberties, here it is <laughs> in the form of hair <laughs> What you like, you can do, but you are not doing what you like. There's a compulsiveness about doing certain things. So this compulsiveness has definitely come to architecture also. I'm glad to see that uh, at least in this school, uh, of the many universities that I've been to, this is the first one, they're able to sit on the floor. Most people are stuck like this. You know <laughs> See, I can't sit without a chair or I can't w walk without a crutch. Is it very different, I'm asking? In some way you crippled yourself, isn't it? What are you going to do if I leave you in the forest? How are you going to shit, I'm asking? <laughs> yes? <laughs> because People think there is some kind of fashion in crippling yourself. So this has gone into every aspect of our life and the architecture. What to say… Of, see, if you look back at ancient India, tch, what aesthetics? I'm sure you're all students of… many of you are students of architecture or even if you're an artist, you notice many things. This is my problem. When I look at something, even if it's little off, even if it's minutely off, my eye doesn't miss it. 
So all the time everything bothers me <laughs> little, little things which are off, geometrically off. Because my experience of life is largely geometric. For me, colors, textures, everything comes later. For me, something is geometrically right is very, very important. Because this is the essence of creation. In the physical world, the most important aspect is geometric perfection. The planets are going around the sun for quite some time. <laughs> Not held together by a steel cable or something. Geometric perfection is keeping it going, isn't it? If the geometry goes off of this solar system, that's the end of it. It'll all fly into oblivion. So geometry is very important. In the yogic sciences, the entire yogic sciences on the physical level is just about aligning your geometry, your individual geometry to the cosmic geometry so that at some point, there is no difference between you and the cosmos. You experience everything as yourself simply because you have attained to a certain level of geometric perfection. It's not just in the body. In your physiological structure, yes, but in your chemical structure, in your energy structure, you get your geometry aligned with the larger geometry so that you and that larger phenomena feels just the same because they're properly aligned. A machine, let's say an engine, let's say a car engine, if we say it is well engineered, essentially we are saying it's geometrically perfect. Yes or no? It is geometrically so perfect, there is least amount of friction. The same goes for this, if it is geometrically perfect, there is least amount of friction. If there is least amount of friction, there is very little wear and tear in terms of life. So architecture is dwellings and usable buildings that we build. In some way, in some way they must find their place with the rest of the creation. I think we've lost this completely simply because we got certain liberty with material. Once steel and concrete came, we thought we can build like this, we can build like this, we can build like this, whichever way we want because of the strength of the material. Doing things with just sheer force is all right sometimes for utility, but if you do everything like that, your life will become ugly. Not only the building, your life will become ugly because you're doing things with force. Life is beautiful when we can do things with minimum force and maximum impact. Yes or no? Anything that we do, we do it with minimum force but with maximum impact, then life feels aesthetic and beautiful. If you exert maximum force for minimum impact, that's a crude way to live. So our architecture has taken to this mode simply because we found material where the strength of the material is such, we can do absurd shapes and still make them stand. Something which has no right to stand up geometrically is standing up simply because of the strength of the material. Uh, if we withdraw from that excitement of finding new material to a more sensible geometry in the world, well, you will see, world will feel much better. People will be much healthier physically and mentally if they live in such buildings. There'll be many other benefits. Above all, you will cause minimum disturbance to everything around you. So, uh, when we started designing buildings, <laughs> now everybody is in appreciation and in agreement, but when I first started talking about it, our own people who are around me, they look at me like this and once I turn back, they roll their eyes at each other, is, is he gone crazy? <laughs> I have… Uh, it's not… The, I have a rear view mirror, they don't understand this. 
but it took lot of talking and talking and talking and talking endlessly to make them understand that it'll work. Some of you said you've been there, is it so? Hmm? So, today all the utility buildings, other things that are being built are being built in many different ways. But fundamentally, anything concerned with the spiritual process in the temple that was built there, mainly they're standing because of geometric perfection, not because of the strength of the material. For example, the dome, it's the largest elliptical dome of its sort, seventy-two feet in diameter. It's not semicircular, it's elliptical like this. And there is no cement, there is no concrete, there's no steel. The simple technology is all the bricks are trying to come down at the same time, but they cannot come down. It's just like if ten of you try to go through the door at once, you cannot go unless one person has some courtesy and they step back. It's my confidence in the bricks <laughs> that they don't have courtesy, none of them will ever step back. So they stood there. The force of gravity which is supposed to bring it down, held it up. See, right now this building, any flat roof for that matter, right now there is a fight going on between this structure and the gravity, going on. Right now going on or not? It is going on. One day somebody will win, who do you think will win? Gravity will win for sure. But we built buildings in such a way, because of gravity, it is staying up. It is not something, if you observe things in nature, it's all… a whole lot of things are built like this. So we never used any steel, just brick, soil, sometimes a percentage of lime, that's about it. And the feel of these buildings is very different because there is no tension in the building, there's no stress happening all the time. So I keep joking, see the building itself is meditating, at least you'll better learn something. The buildings are meditative because there's no stress in them. They're using the forces which are trying to pull them down as the force to stay up. This is something every human being should learn. What are the forces which try to bring us down? That is what you must use to go up. In a way, if you know something about aerodynamics, you would know aerodynamics is not against gravity. It is just using gravity to take off in a certain way. An airplane with the right kind of wings is not necessarily against gravity, but a rocket is against gravity. It's just the kind of thrust it has is like a forceful way of getting away. But an airplane is not made like that, simply is carrying tons and tons, you know. It doesn't matter how many times you have seen an airplane land and take off, you can still go on watching because there is something amazing about it that some hundred, hundred and twenty tons simply takes off and flies. If it is See, there are two kinds of flying machines, there are rotary wing machines and there are fixed wing machines. That is fixed wing airplanes and the helicopters. A helicopter is taking off with sheer force. If you don't know this, I'm… <laughs> I'm a licensed helicopter pilot. So, helicopter when you fly, moment to moment you have to keep it flying. But when you fly an airplane, all you have to do is take off and just leave it. Landing you must know unless you're a Bin Laden pilot <laughs> Landing you have to learn, those guys didn't want to learn landing, <laughs> they are different. But it's only the landing which is really the challenge, rest of it is just child's play. Actually if you put a ten-year-old boy, he will make a 747 takeoff. Only landing is a problem, but landing today machines are doing better than human beings. I will, you know, like when I'm flying this Air India from Mumbai to New York three, four times in a year, 
Uh, sometimes I'm there with the pilots talking to them, then I was just discussing these things and said, to what extent are you using the autopilot? He said, Sadhguru, we feel ashamed in front of you to say this, but she lands better than us <laughs> you, you just let it, it lands by itself. It has all the data how Mumbai airfield is made. If you just set it and sleep, it will land. People are talking about driverless cars, that's never going to happen in Mumbai traffic. <laughs> but a driver… A, a pilotless airplane is very much a doable thing. It's only people's fear you have to manage that the airplane is flying without a pilot, you have to manage the passengers. <laughs> that's the only problem, otherwise it's very easy to make a pilotless airplane. A lot of pilots are sleeping. Now there is by law, if the flight is more than uh, some four hours or so, a pilot can sleep for forty minutes or fifty minutes, something. There is a law now that they can actually officially sleep because it's a big sky, it's not going to hit anything. <laughs> Why I'm saying this is, the same goes for buildings. You can make the building either come up like with some exuberance or it's standing like a depressed person. This is something, suppose you see a building like a human being, do you want to look at their face or you want to avoid their face? That's how a building should be. If you look at their face, you must feel joy. How essentially it's a geometric manipulation, <laughs> how geometrically perfect it is will give that much sense of completeness to people when they visually see it because the human eye, is one eye on the planet which catches the maximum amount of detail. Because it catches so much detail, most important part of any physical structure is geometry. And some people can consciously catch it, others unconsciously react to it. They like it or they don't like it, that's all they know. But some people can consciously see, okay, this is the reason why it feels like this. So when it comes to architecture, it should not be in terms of European, Indian, this, that. These styles are established at a time when materials were limited, all right? The material available was so limited in those regions, accordingly they structured it. And most of the time everybody copied one architect in that area and that became the culture. That need not be the future of Indian architecture, but India having a history of tremendous aesthetics and if you go to the ancient temples, you must come to the south because North India, most of the temples, the ancient temples are all gone. The new ones that they have built is all put up in a hurry. When they got a chance, they put it up like, uh, you know, how they put a Brahmalala suddenly in two days, like that. But if you come to the south and see, one amazing thing you will see is their sense of geometry, unbelievable. How they arrived at this sense of geometry, thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, absolute geometric sense in their mind. Well, you have seen the Kailash, I'm sure, at Ellora, the Kailash temple. You have seen Belur Halibid, have you? The Karnataka temples. Oh, it's a must-see. It's just a must-see for any human being, especially those of you who are in architecture, art, whatever you are into. Some aesthetics you are into means this is something you must see. It's more than seeing those sculptures. You must look into the minds of people who did this. If you want to look into their minds, you must withdraw yourself into that time zone. It's over thousand years ago, when there were no cranes, when there were no machines, when there were no trucks. Then there are no any kind of mechanical things, all by hand. Why would somebody endeavor to dump… do something so phenomenal and so almost superhuman in terms of engineering and the physical difficulty of lifting these huge rocks and doing this carving business? Why would anybody do that? What… what kind of passion should be firing those people to do this is unbelievable. If you see the Tanjavur temple, have you seen? 
this… Uh, this gopuram weighs I think, what? 180 tons, huh? 180, is it? Does anybody know? I think somewhere in that range, over 120 tons for sure. And it is at a height of 160 feet. They put a ramp of ten miles, a mud ramp, and they brought this single piece of stone, hundred and sixty feet high above and made a gopuram out of it, exquisitely carved. Well, in Karnataka what they carved is soapstone. In Tamil Nadu, Tamil people are crazy, they carved granite <laughs> into very fine structures, which is far more difficult than carving soapstone. And they put it up there. What is it that's firing these human beings? Before you take up any project, you must visit this and see what kind of human beings are these, you know? Just for aesthetics, you understand? Not for livelihood. It's not a factory shed we are building. Just for aesthetics, they were willing to invest their lives absolutely, everything they got. I think we need that culture back if we want to create a beautiful India, very important. I had a question, how do we learn to say no? When you know that uh, something is… Uh, like saying yes would affect you in an adverse way, uh, but you, still… You, you must send your WhatsApp message, no <laughs> Because it happens with me a lot of times that I want to say no, but thinking of what the other person would uh, feel, I tend to say yes. So how do we stop that? <laughs> I know in what context you're asking. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> That's not what I meant. <laughs> That's not what I meant. <laughs> I mean to say small things in life, this and that. But I've been always encouraging people to say yes and yes for everything. Yes or no, if I ask. People around me always say, Sadhguru, it's always yes, tell us what. So for you to say an absolute yes to everything, one important thing is you must create an atmosphere of integrity and trust. Hmm? If you create an atmosphere of absolute integrity and trust, all of us can say absolute yes when we know nobody will misuse our yes. We can all say hundred percent yes for everything, isn't it? That's what we should strive for. If it's not possible in the whole world, at least we must create small circles where we can say yes and there is no problem. Nobody misuses a yes. Very important. Very important for healthy unfolding of every life that you need at least a small cocoon of life around you where you can be a total yes. Without fear or favor, you can be an absolute yes. This you must create. If you don't create this, you will always live in fear. Being exploited is one thing. Being… Li living in a fear of exploitation is actually more damaging than exploitation itself. So today we are creating a world where, well, there is some reason for it also. There is reason for it also, I am not trying to live in some utopian world, I know how the world is, but I am saying you must create your own little world where you can say yes without any consequence to the yes, it's important. If we do not do this, then we will always live in walls. No is a wall, isn't it? In India, nobody says just no. They'll say, no, 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 no <laughs> Have you seen this? <laughs> Nowhere else it happens, only in India. No, 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 no. They think one no won't stop them <laughs> No is a wall, yes is a doorway, isn't it? 
if you open your door, a devil could come in or the divine could come in. The fear that devil may come in, if you close the door, you have also closed the door for the divine. What an unfortunate life, yes or no? You not only closed your door to negativity, you closed your door to everything because some negativity once came through your door. Don't do that to yourself. Once you live here, there are dangers of life, of course. But because there are dangers to life, if you close all possibilities to life, that'll become a very absurd and sad life. The walls that you build for self-preservation are also the walls of self-imprisonment. Hmm? If you build a wall to protect yourself today, after some time, this is your prison, isn't it? So no, 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 you built a wall around yourself. Can I say yes to anybody for anything? No, that's not possible, we've still not created that kind of a world. That's too high up there. That's why you must create at least a little world where you can say yes without consequence. Very important. My question is, uh, how does one deal with insecurities? Oh, <laughs> please. How does one deal with insecurity? Life is insecure. There is no security about life because Shall I reveal a secret to you? Hmm? However young and healthy you are, you're going to die one day. <laughs> I'll bless you with a long life, but you will die one day. Is it okay? Is it okay? No? <laughs> so you can die joyfully or you can die crying, it's up to you. But anyway you'll die one day. Yes or no? If you say, I don't want to die, today you start the chanting, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, I don't want to die, all that will happen is you will not live but you will die. <laughs> yes? The fear I don't want to die will make you not live but it will not make you not die, anyway you will die. Coming to terms with mortality is one very important thing. If you don't come to terms with mortality, you're living in a fancy world of unreal world, not in the real world. The real world is, we come and go. So many countless number of people have come and gone before us, isn't it? You're a <laughs> You are in an institution from 1857. I was just wondering how they started an institution in that year because in that year there was such turmoil all over the country, hmm? 19… 1857. Lot of upheaval in the country but somehow somebody managed to start an institution. The soil that you're walking upon, we don't know how many people are buried, yes or no? All these countless people, number of people who walked this planet before you and me, where are they? They are all topsoil, yes or no? This will also become topsoil one day, unless your friends choose to bury you real deep, <laughs> fearing you may raise from the dead. Uh, there have… there have been certain instances. This happened. There was an old couple in Texas, over seventy-five years of age. It was their dream to go to the Holy Land or the Jerusalem. 
But because of business and then children, children growing up, going to the university and their marriages and da-da-da, they never made it. When they're over seventy-five years of age, they made the trip to Jerusalem. Tch. Jerusalem is a place where every cobblestone reeks of history. So they walked that pathway where Jesus is supposed to have walked, they went to that place where he's supposed to walk, have walked in the water and many things like this. They were overwhelmed by this whole experience. And unfortunately, the lady had a heart attack and she died. Then the man was preparing to take her body back to Texas. But then the local people approached and said, See, Jerusalem is the holy land. This is the right place to die. She's done the right thing. So let's do all the rituals here and bury her here. And it just costs you twenty-five thousand dollars. Because if you take her back to Texas, just the transportation costs eighteen thousand dollars and local charges and in America the cemetery charges are very heavy. All this put together, you will spend much more money and above all, she's chosen to die in the holy land. This is where she must be buried, let's do it. The man said, no, I'm taking her back to Texas. They said, see, you're very distressed because of your wife's death. You're not able to think straight, we can understand. So we will give you a super discount, fifteen thousand dollars. This is a haggling place, you know. Let's do it. The man thought about it and he said, no, I will take her back to Texas. Then they said, see, it doesn't make sense. You, you, I can see you're very distressed. You lost your wife of forty-five years, so obviously you're very, very distressed. You're not thinking straight at all. We can understand this just because of that. You are an American and you are from Texas, so we give you an absolute super, super discount. Ten thousand dollars, let's do it. Come on, let's do it, let's do it. You must… what I am talking, if you want to understand, you must go to Kashi or Hardwar, <laughs> some place, how these things happen, you know <laughs> Then the man thought about it and he said, no, I am taking her back to Texas. And they threw their hands up and said, why? What's the problem with you? Ten thousand dollars, let's do it. He said, see, in Texas, dead stay dead. <laughs> so, if you come to terms with your mortality, security, insecurity, all these things will go. You are living on a daily basis as if you are forever. The fundamental awareness that this is mortal, this is here only for a limited amount of time, if this was a regular… you know, a normal conscious thing for you, you would put your life to best use for sure. And if you come to terms with that one thing, there would be no insecurity because there's nothing to gain, nothing to lose in this life. You came with nothing. Whatever the hell is happening, you're on the profit side. Yes or no? Huh? Isn't it so? Did you come with investment? No. You come with nothing. So whatever the hell is happening, you're always on the profit side, isn't it? And anyway, they don't allow you to take a container <laughs> in the end. So all you have is how profound, intense and beautiful is your experience of life. So don't make too much fuss about it. You are acting as if you are going to lose something. No, there is nothing to lose, nothing to gain because you come and you go. You may think, oh, my life, my life. No, it's your… your life on this planet is like a pop-up. On the computer screen, you've seen these pop-ups? You just a pop-up and pop-out. In the meantime, will you rise and shine is the only question, all right?
So if any way you shine, sometimes you may be seen by people, sometimes you may not be seen by people. The important is you… Sh you are shining within yourself and that's all that matters. If people have eyes, they will see it. If they have no eyes, they won't see it. That's their problem. But you are living an intense and profound life. That's all that matters here. If you understand this and if you bring this into your life, insecurity will not happen because security can happen only in death. Yes or no? People keep asking me, c coming to me and uh, asking me, Sadhguru, please bless us, nothing should happen to us. I say, hey, what kind of blessing is this? My blessing is let everything happen to you. <laughs> everything that's life must happen to you. Have you come here to avoid life or have you come here to experience life? Please, you must make a decision right now. Have you come here to avoid life or to experience life? Experience life. All the different dimensions of what this life holds must happen to you, isn't it so? If you come to avoid life, there's an ocean right here. You can jump into the ocean. See, if you want to avoid life, you must die. It's a more efficient way of doing things, isn't it? You're alive and you try to avoid life, it'll become miserable. If you feel insecure, that's what you will do you will try to avoid life. When you're alive and try to avoid life, it will cause immense misery. When you're alive, you live. When you die, you die. Don't get up from the dead. Uh, Namaskaram Sadhguru, I am Alina Jacob, a student of third year architecture. Uh, my question is, uh, we live in a society uh, where people are half… Uh, where, where we find people who are extrovert and introvert in nature. So the people who are extrovert, they are confident enough to express themselves. But meanwhile, in this competitive world, people who are introvert, will they ever be able to make a stand or mark as good as the way the extroverts do it? And even if they manage to reach somewhere in life, will they continue to be an introvert? See, uh, the difference between uh, this extrovert or introvert is, or what these two things are is, it's like mistaking your exhalation for inhalation and inhalation for exhalation. There is no such thing as extrovert or introvert. Do not classify people like that. Some people, see that they need to act and reach out. Some people see there is not much need for that. So maybe they are not on the Twitter and Facebook and whatever, this doesn't mean they're introvert. They have a life of their own. We should not judge people like this. Every human being has a right to be whichever way they want. But now the question is, if I am not extrovert, will I? be able to do things in the world, that's a main aspect of the question. <clears throat> See, your ability to do things is not because you want to do things. I want to do something is my desire. Desire is just an intention. An intention won't make things happen. An intention will only set direction. Still you have to make the journey, isn't it? Now, one important thing, especially because you're artist, you're not in business program or something like that, I think you should look at life like this. You must see how to enhance this one. Enhance this one means not blow up your ego in a big way. Enhance the life that you are. When I say life, I am talking about the life that you are. I am not talking about your body, I am not talking about the structure of your mind, I am not talking about… see, when people say life, you are supposed to decipher. They could be talking about their home, they could be talking about their relationship, they could be talking about their car or their dog or something. My life means something. I am not talking about that, I am talking about the life that you are. Are you alive? Are you really alive? 
or just a bundle of thoughts, emotions, ideas, prejudices, opinions. Most people are just this. Because of that, we make conclusions. This is an introvert, this is an extrovert. Because without conclusion, you can't have a thought. You need conclusions and conclusions and conclusions about everything. Now I need to conclude this is introvert, this is extrovert. Otherwise, my thought every time freaks, okay, who the, who the hell is she? But human faculties are such, I don't have to conclude, I can just look. This moment, how she is, that's all that matters. Yesterday, how she was, doesn't matter, isn't it? And tomorrow, how she's going to be, you have no clue? Yes or no? Do not fix life, either yours or anybody else's. Do not fix it because what you're calling as human life is a possibility. To make this possibility into your reality, you have to travel a distance. Do you have the courage and the commitment to travel the distance? That's all the question is. It doesn't matter what is your level of intelligence, what is your level of capability, introvert, extrovert, this, that, doesn't matter. Do you have the courage and commitment to make the possibility into your reality? That's all the question is. So, if you focus, whatever you're doing right now, it doesn't matter what it is. How simple an act you're doing right now, it doesn't matter. If you're absolutely devoted to that that you're doing right now, depending upon various aspects, things will unfold. But because of Western influences, we've become too goal-oriented. Goal-oriented means we are interested in the consequence, but we are not interested in the process. If you are not interested in the process, you should not be an artist. If you are not in the interested in the pro process, you should never design a building because it's going to land on somebody's head. Yes? Process is an end in itself. If you are absolutely devoted to the process, depending upon various aspects, something will come out. But now we are interested in the consequence, not in the process. This goal-orientedness, I want to get there, I want to get there, where the hell do you want to get? No, I want to win the race. See, if you treat life as a race, if you have to win it, you have to get to the finish line soon, isn't it? You want to? Hello? If you get to the finish line ahead of all these people, you won the race. You know what the finish line is? We'll be negotiating where to bury you <laughs> So, particularly being in creative arts, don't ever think of a goal. What should I become? How should I be? What should I create? Don't worry about these things. If you're devoted to the process, something will come out something more beautiful than you imagine will happen because you're devoted to the process. Without devotion, I'm specifically using the word devotion because people think devotion means going to the temple, church or mosque. No, without devotion, either in sport, art, music, spirituality, politics, business, anything, any arena of life, has anybody done anything truly significant? without being absolutely devoted to what they're doing, have they? No, mediocre things you can do. So do not think of art and aesthetics as a way to earn a living. Living will happen. Living will happen. This is what I'm promising people of all professions, no matter what, especially if you're an artist. If you have problem with bread, you come to me, I will make sure you have a roof and a bread. Only thing I want to see is, you're focused on something, I don't care what. Nothing came out of your focus, I don't care. But I want to see you focused on something. I can't stand unfocused people, that's all. <laughs> I'm… I'm making an open-ended offer. Anybody who's worrying about bread, you just come to me. I'll make sure you eat for the rest of your life and you have a place to stay.
but I want to see you at least twelve hours a day focused on something, whatever the damn thing is. I won't ask you what you're focused on, but I want to see you focused. Because if a human being stays focused on something, inevitably it'll yield. How can it not yield? The universe will yield to you if you're focused. Namaskaram Sadhguru, my name is Muskan Bhavna and my question to you is that many times in life we face situations where we don't know what next, we don't know what is going on right now, we are completely blacked out. And at that point of time, our friends, our parents, we are given this one suggestion, be positive. But yeah. when I don't know what's going on, how do I be positive? And at that time, clarity seems more important than positivity. So how do we place the two? So what they're calling it as positive is uh, confidence. Have confidence, don't worry. Confidence without clarity is a disaster. <laughs> yes. If you cannot see clearly, at least you must be hesitant. If you're confident, you're going to walk into something. By chance you may escape sometimes, but what comes your way you don't know. So it's not about being positive, negative. The important thing is, at this stage in your life, you just focus on enhancing this life. Don't worry about what it will yield. You should not worry about what this life is going to yield. What it yields depends on times in which we are, many other aspects of life. But if this is an enhanced life, it will yield something worthwhile. Doesn't matter what it yields, who knows, maybe you won't become an artist, maybe you will become an engineer, maybe you will become a doctor, maybe you will become something else, who the hell cares? As long as you enhance this life, something worthwhile will come out of it. What will happen in the end? What will happen in the end? The same thing. In the end, as we told you, this happened. A hardcore criminal was given death sentence in America. Elec death by electric chair. So, always the priest comes in the end. And uh, the priest came and said, My son, just tell me what do you want me to do? Whatever you wish, I will do. A very unrepentant convict said, Father, when they Pull the plunger, please hold my hand <laughs> So, very positive <laughs> There are various ways to look at this. I had a nasty joke, I'm trying to da scale it down so that uh, it fits into the institution. <laughs> See, when I don't know what is future, that's a very insightful statement because nobody knows what is the future. Do you know what's going to happen in the next five minutes? No. No, Sadhguru, my astrologer… Well, does your astrologer know what is going to happen in the next ten minutes of his life? Does he know? No. He does not know ten minutes of his life, but he knows your entire life. It's a fantastic thing, you know. So, you don't know future, isn't that a great thing, fortunately? Suppose you know your entire future, would you not want to commit suicide right now? Huh? Isn't it wonderful that in spite of all your brains, you can't figure what is next moment? Hello? Isn't it wonderful? Have you ever seen a suspense thriller movie? Have you? See, right now there's a very wonderful, wonderful suspense thriller in the local theater. None of you have seen it. I have seen it. Shall I tell you the story? Yes. 
okay, the whole story is going to take too much time, so I'll just tell you the last suspense part of it, okay? <laughs> Shall I? No. Why? Because suspense means like this, you go and see the poster, oh, this guy's… I think he's going to do this, that guy's going to do that, oh, this director, most probably this how it's going to go. Then you go inside, see all those still images, then you say, definitely this guy is going to do this, that guy is going to do this, all kinds of projections. You go and sit in the auditorium, first few scenes and said, this is it, he's going to do this, but he did something different. Then you said, he's going to do that and he did something different. You said, this is going to happen and something else happened. Halfway down the movie, you discuss with your friend, last scene is definitely like this. When the last scene came, something totally different happened. Then you come out and say, wow, what a wonderful movie, yes? You went there, sat, you saw the first scene and you said, this is what is going to happen and that's what happened in the last scene, as it happens in most movies. Then you come out and said, this is no good, isn't it? So essentially what you're saying is, if all your predictions go wrong, it's wonderful. If all your predictions come true, it's no good. Then I'm asking, what's wrong with your life? Your life is fantastic. You can predict whatever, it all goes wrong, goes wrong, goes wrong. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Only problem is, you lost your ability to enjoy the suspense, that's your only problem. Yes? You want to know the end, you're a match fixer. <laughs> yes, you're a match fixer. You want to know the end before you play the game, match fixer or no? Today it's a crime in this country, match fixing, you know. <laughs> so don't try to match fix your life. Let's see what the hell happens, huh? <laughs> Whatever happens, you came here with nothing, you'll go with nothing, so what the hell? The only thing is, did you make your life's experience profound enough, intense enough? That's all there is. What's there to happen? So what will happen tomorrow? What will happen tomorrow? I'll give you a simple thing. The best thing about life is tomorrow never happens. Yes? If you just know how to deal with what's now, you know how to deal with your entire life. This moment if you know how to manage your thought, your emotion and your body, rest, drama outside happens. But if this is like this, this will be joyful and wonderful no matter what's the drama around you, <laughs> yes? Oh, what if this happens, what if that happens? Yes, all those things can happen. But you came here to experience life, not to avoid life, isn't it? Are we sure? Are we sure? You want to right now go into the museum? No, no, no. Oh, you're misunderstanding my question, you're art students <laughs> No, no, I'm not asking you to go for a visit in the museum, I'm… as an artifact, do you want to go into the museum right now yourself? No, this is the time to live. To live means you don't know what the hell is tomorrow, anything. Either you must be excited about it or you can be fearful about it. You're fearful about it because you already fixed what should happen. You're afraid what you think may not happen. But first of all, I'm asking you, why are you thinking what should happen? If you're dedicated to the process, Depending upon what process we are doing, accordingly life will unfold tomorrow. Yes? There are many dimensions to it. If you explore all of it, if you just explore your biology, life will happen one way. In the sense, if you take charge of your physical self, your body, fifteen to twenty percent of your life and destiny will happen the way you want it. If you take charge of your mind, your thought and emotion, fifty to sixty percent of your life and destiny will happen the way you want it. If you take charge of your life energies, 
one hundred percent of your life and destiny will happen the way you want it. This is a choice you have. I think I must leave before I'm ousted. What's your time, please? Namaskar. My name is Kausto. I actually wanted to ask you that after all the knowledge you've gained over time, do you believe this community, the society, the very system we are living in is correct or I'd say appropriate? Uh, I, I mean, oh, whatever we are living in is just an imaginary concept. I mean, I feel, uh, I feel we're designed and are capable to do a lot more, <coughs> a lot more than we think. But instead, our efforts of our body and literally whole lives are wasted on what? Earning for life, which is already given to us. So, I mean, it's like wasting all your precious energy on a dream which uh, doesn't really have any existence to life. You're telling me or...? I'm asking you, what do you think? <laughs> you're, you're wondering What's your whether, take on this? You're wondering whether my life is being wasted or...? Yes. <laughs> my, my, not... It's mine. <laughs> See, it once happened, Shankaran Pillai was running a small street-side restaurant and then his chicken cutlets became so famous, people started que queuing up for his chicken cutlets. He sold in hundreds, made a lot of money. Then because there were other laws, somebody said, he is mixing beef with chicken cutlet and selling it. So they investigated and they found, yes he was. Then he was taken to the court. The judge asked, now that it's proven that you have been mixing beef and chicken in your chicken cutlets and deceiving people, how much of these both things were you mixing? Shankaran Pillai said, fifty-fifty. The judge asked, what do you mean fifty-fifty? He said, one chicken, one cow <laughs> So, <laughs> the chances of your life being useful or wasted in a society is fifty-fifty. You have to decide whether you're a chicken or a cow <laughs> My name is Ipsita Zadha from First Year Architecture and my question is that uh, in our society, religious beliefs are a very Let sensitive… Me, if you can hold it this way. In our society, religious beliefs are a very sensitive topic and we come across many people who blindly believe in things. So, how do we uh, talk to them and uh, ask them to think rationally instead of just believing in things? <clears throat> See, uh, there is no such thing as uh, blind belief and seeing belief. Belief is only because you cannot see something. You don't believe things that you clearly see, isn't it? You see them. For example, do you believe that you have two hands or do you know that you have two hands? Huh? You know. Can somebody argue with you and prove to you that you have no two hands? If their argument becomes too overwhelming, one slap in the face, <laughs> they know you got hands. Proof, the power of proof. But let's say, say I'm walking into trouble. Let's say if I ask you, do you believe in God? Some people say yes, some people say no. Why do you believe? Because you're not sincere enough to admit, I don't know, isn't it? The fact of the matter is, 
many things that we do not know, we believe. Because fundamentally, we've lost the sense of being straight or fundamental sense of integrity is not there in us. We believe things which we do not know. It is so wonderful and human of you to simply admit what you do not know as I do not know, isn't it? What I know, I know. What I do not know, I do not know. Isn't it wonderful? And I do not know is a tremendous possibility. Only when you see I do not know, the possibility of knowing arises in your life. The longing to know, the seeking to know and the possibility of knowing becomes a living reality in your life. And when you see I do not know, when you profoundly realize I do not know, you will have an awakened intelligence which is always on. If you believe something, immediately it will go to sleep. For example, You're all architect students, architecture students. What do you think, is the planet round or flat? Tell me whatever you think, it's okay with me. Is this planet round or flat? Round? Flat? You from Bangalore? <laughs> Bangalore book became popular, earth is flat, you know. Is it round or flat? It's round. And the damn thing is spinning all the time. And you're not even on North Pole, you're at a certain latitude. If you look up, inevitably you're looking up in the wrong direction, isn't it? I'm talking about the upper wala. You don't know what is upper. Can you know? Do you know which side is up in this cosmos? Is it somewhere marked this side up? Are you capable of knowing which side is up? No. So you do not know which is up, but you know who is up. <laughs> this is very dangerous. It's caused immense disturbance and hatred and violence and wars and all kinds. But it has its benefits because it's a very inexpensive psychiatry. When you feel shit scared of life, don't worry, God is with you. You feel good. If you have to go to psychiatric counseling, it's very expensive and you need a lot of furniture. And it's inefficient, one-on-one, on one, one on one. It's not like that. This can be dispensed large scale. It is useful for people. So there's no point destroying it, that's what I'm saying. There's no point destroying religion, but you must transit from religion to responsibility, it's very important. Once your basic problems of fear and anxiety are handled, you must move from religion to responsibility. This entire movement is just this, to move people from religion to responsibility, from looking up to looking in, because everything that a human being can explore is within, not up in the sky. Yes or no? If there is anything worthwhile, your joy and misery, your intelligence and stupidity, your nonsense and all the most valuable things, everything is within, isn't it so? If you don't explore, explore this interiority and you're looking at the sky, sometimes the bird… birds may decide to do something on your face. <laughs> that could enlighten you <laughs> Yes <laughs> And right now what's happened is, this… See, the problem is this brain, this intelligence is new to you, it's still new. In the evolutionary scheme of things, if you look at it, since when your cerebrum… cerebral uh, flower 
expanded like this, if you look at it, in terms of the life of this planet, it's just a few seconds before it came to action. So this intelligence is new, that's what you're struggling with. Your suffering, your pains, your stuff is simply because you have not come to terms with how to handle this intelligence. Once your intelligence turns against you, no force in the universe can save you, isn't it? <laughs> so, religion is a certain face of humanity where we are learning to handle and temper our own intelligence in a certain way. Is it bad? I don't think so. Is it good? Not at all. It is a question of individual need, where they are in their evolution. Accordingly, one must use it. But because intelligence is new, it hurts. This happened. Once, uh, a pirate, you know pirate? You know pirates? Not uh, today's modern Somalian pirates, they are different. They have no romance with them. Pirate, the pirate, a classic pirate of the past, his name was Jack. He came to an Irish bar. He came, he had a wooden stump for a leg, one leg and he had a hook for his right hand and he had a eye patch. The bartender looked at him and said, Hey Jack, what happened? Last time I saw you, you were fine. What happened to your leg? Ah, uh, he said, you know, this stupid Her Majesty service, they attacked our ship and the cannonball took away my leg. But no problem, our ship carpenter fixed up with this wooden leg, it's just doing great, I can even dance. Then he served him a drink and then asked, what happened to your hand, why this hook? He said, once again, you know, I was in a sword fight, these days these idiots don't know sword should hit a sword, they hit my hand <laughs> and this hand went away, but no problem, our ship Blacksmith fixed up this hook, it actually works better than the hand. Then served one more dink and asked, but what happened to your eye? Oh, I was just trying to navigate the ship in the night, looking at the stars, a bird pooped in my face. So the bartender said, come on, bird poop can't take off, take off your eyeball. No, the hook was just two days old, you know <laughs> Right now, that's all that's happening. Your hook is just two days old, so you are scratching yourself all over the place. This is the first thing you must learn, that you learn to handle your intelligence in such a way that it works for you, never against you, never against you. Right now, it's working against you. You may call it stress, you may call it anxiety, you may call it fear, you may call it insecurity, you may call it whatever the hell you want, but essentially your intelligence is working against you, isn't it? If your intelligence works against you, uh, there is no hope. You don't need any enemies, most people don't need any enemies, they're just doing fine by themselves, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> I think. <laughs> so, I would like to make use of this opportunity to tell you that, uh, as we said earlier, India has been uh, a land of tremendous aesthetics thousands of years ago. But today, if you look at the homes that we are building, all the seventy-two shades of Asian paints are used in one two-bedroom house. I want all of you to take this on a mission mode that you must bring aesthetics, aesthetics back into this land.
it's very, very important because the quality of our life is not just determined by what we eat and what we wear, the shapes and forms and the aesthetic around us. Have… have you… many of you travel to Nepal and Bhaktapur and… Hmm? Only one? No, you can't do this. You must visit Bhaktapur, you must visit Dwarika in Nepal, you must see because this is… Uh, you know, with simple things that they have, whatever they had thousand years ago, it's all brick and terracotta. With this, the level of aesthetics that they've created a thousand years ago is something so amazing and fantastic. Only a small part of it is remaining. That remaining part still amazes us, how did they do this? So, uh, you're most welcome. Please make use of Isha Yoga Center in whichever way you can, those of you who've focused on something. If you want to go into hibernation, but focused hibernation, we will offer you a place and um, two meals a day. Because I feel artists and creative people must not, must not be thinking of timelines. By the time I'm in twenty-five, I must have produced hundred pieces of art. This is a stupid way to go. Maybe there'll be times to hibernate, maybe there'll be times to wait. Please make use of this, we are available to you in whatever way. I wish all of you a possibility of uh, finding access to the world in such a way that whatever your talents are, find expression in this country and the rest of the world. Thank you very much. तो भाई हरि देश रहा I mean, uh, how we think and how he thinks is completely different and it just gave us a, you know, a point of view that, you know, how actually you should, you know, start thinking about our culture and how we should promote it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Sadhguruji. Sadhguru.